call him Skyler Williams. Uh, I've been the spokesperson for Landback Lane for this past year and a couple of months. You know, coming out to Toronto and I'm starting to understand some of the issues that have been coming up and seeing that Indigenous people in the city here make up 40% of those living without homes in these encampments across the city. These are our people. People that have suffered more than most. People that have had, had to witness the trauma of being going through residential school or parents of. People that have been through these schools, these missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that have been stolen from our communities. And so for these people to be brutalized in the way that Toronto police have decided and this council and this mayor and council have decided to treat our people. Horses are just around the corner. Where? And so I want to make sure that it is very, very clear to John Tory and everybody, every councillor in Toronto that understands that whenever our people call out for help, regardless of whether they're in the bush at Landback Lane or where they're in downtown, we are going to be there to support them. We're going to have their backs no matter what. Because these are our people. So I'm going to make sure, as we move forward in all of this, that people like my brother Jack here are going to make sure that I'm going to have their back. Because that's what we do, and that's what, what that's how we keep each other safe. These cops on horseback, and, like this is not what keeps our people safe. Making sure that we stand for each other regardless of whether or not we got the time or the capacity to do it, we're going to make sure that we're we're going to be there to make sure that this shit never happens again. Thank you, Skylar from Landback Lane. Woo! Folks speaking today will be available for questions after uh, the lineup goes through. Unfortunately, Skylar does have to leave, but um, if you want to reach out to him, you can get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch. Thank you. So my name is Sam and I'm with the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. We're a group that fights for the rights of poor working people, especially the right to safe and permanent housing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I'm here to talk about the encampment clearings. And whether you're new to this, uh, level of violence or you're very familiar with it, it can be hard to witness. So I ask folks to please be prepared to hear some intense stories today. Take care of yourself as you need and don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions, comments, or concerns after the event. As federal parties unveil electoral platforms that are primarily targeting middle income earners, it is obvious that poor working people's needs and beyond are never considered a real priority. Tomorrow, September 17th at 9 a.m., many of us will be attending online the first court date for one of the 11 people charged criminally at Lamport Stadium Park and to Toronto Police's 14 Division Station on July 21st of this year for standing up for real permanent housing for all. Every year, the City of Toronto forcibly clears encampments in an attempt to invisibilize homelessness and erase evidence of the ever-growing housing and opioid crises. The past 18 months, accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, more people than ever before are sleeping rough, crammed into the shelter system, and at risk of losing their homes. Shame. During this time, as unhoused people attempted to take refuge in parks and live with dignity, supported by a spectrum of allies with their own hardships, the city turned its back on us. Shame. Offering neither support nor solutions. Community members who compensated for the city's negligence by building tiny shelters in order to prevent people in parks from freezing to death over the winter were personally legally targeted by the city, threatened with an injunction, and immobilized. The city, and the city didn't stop there. Mayor John Tory and the rest of city council issued trespass notices throughout four major Toronto encampments at the beginning of March. 
When networks of neighbors and friends tried to stop the city from displacing encampment residents, they were met with violence at Lamport Stadium Park and with extreme violence at Trinity Bellwoods, Alexander Park, and again at Lamport Stadium. By now, people across the city and around the world have seen images of the violence that Toronto Police Services enacted during these clearings. On July 21st at Lamport Stadium in particular, hundreds of people stood alongside the residents to defend their homes. An overzealous and militarized police presence in full riot gear responded with batons to our heads and, and, and batons to our heads and wrists, knees on our necks, choking, dragging, and indiscriminately pepper spraying us. Multiple people were hospitalized, requiring stitches and casts, or suffering from concussions. 34 arrests were made at Lamport alone. Another 11 people were criminally charged that day. Altogether, 50 of us were charged with trespass or highly questionable tr criminal charges from the full or partial clearing of these three parts. Four 45 people have been elected to fight their charges or tickets. Several of those who were injured are also pursuing legal options and are part of the collective effort to push back. Those who stood up against evictions at each of these clearings include both current and former residents of encampments, friends and family of these residents, neighbors and community members who wanted to show their support, outreach workers, and volunteers. Those arrested came from many walks of life, including those who were encampment residents, despite statements made by John Tory. Once arrested and ticketed, some of us were denied access to lawyers for eight hours or more. While detained, people with disabilities were denied necessary accommodations and food. Shame! Others were denied medical care after being beaten by the police. Throughout the day at Lamport, as at other clearings, police and city employees threatened both legal observers and members of the media, intimidating them with threats of arrest and removal from the site so they wouldn't be able to document the brutal actions of 14 Division under the supervision of Sergeant Israel Bernardo. Contrary to, <laughs> contrary to repeated misleading statements by, made by city spokespeople, including the mayor, city councillors and city employees, nobody living in any of the encampments was offered permanent housing before the evictions. One woman who was displaced three times was finally given access to permanent housing as of this week, as reported by the CBC. Beyond that, most residents have had to move to new outdoor places where they are trying to rebuild, albeit with less belongings, less community, and the lasting emotional and physical damage caused by the city and Toronto police. Tory has made it very clear that he does not care about poor working people. He lies about the availability of permanent housing for people who are unhoused, he spouts mistruths about who we are, and he unabashedly de deceives the public about the gross misuse of city resources and the unrestrained actions of the police, all while sitting on the Toronto Police Services Board. He continues to pri prioritize the needs and interests of a corporate real estate in investors and the wealthy elite whose increasing power is a fundamental cause of Toronto's long-standing housing crisis. Shame! Elected representatives have stalled for decades on meaningful action. Government stopped investing in social housing in the 1990s. What we see today is the cumulative effect of 30 years of negligence. Passing the buck and making housing into a business venture, leaving renters the, and the underhoused and the unhoused at the mercy of the market. These parties talk about the creation of affordable housing. Affordable is a misnomer. It is weak-willed political jargon intended to be big. What we need is not-for-profit housing, safe quality social housing, such as rent and geared to income housing, a serious investment in the housing cooperative model, and the deep privatization of long-term care. We need housing that's designed for people, not for profit. as we have personally borne witness, individually and collectively, to extreme violence, harm, false rhetoric, manipulation, and police brutality. It is time for the City of Toronto to stop blaming poverty on poor people. We demand an end to the criminalization of poverty and dissent, especially in the form of forced and unhoused encampment 
evictions. We demand that all of our charges, both ticketing and criminal, be immediately dropped. It is both our right and our responsibility to push back against the unjust laws, policies, and behavior that hurts and undermines the strength of our communities. And we demand that all three levels of government come together to create timely, sustainable, and not-for-profit housing solutions that will address the roots of this crisis and ensure permanent, safe housing for all poor and working people. Thank you. Next, I want to bring up Jack Moss Park. He's a resident of Moss Park, and he was present for all the full and attempted evictions. He was arrested and ticketed for trespassing. Welcome, Jack. My name is Jack. I got illegally arrested after I brutally beat it up by cops at the lab court. I unlawfully detained for more than two hours. I bought a transparency public park. I got charged for $65. It's abnormal because usually transparency tickets charge only cost $65 that be arrested at two hours last detained. I mean all the protests against eviction include Trinity Bellwood and Central Park and uh, of course Lamport. My, myself is an incapitant resident. I've been living at Moss Park for more than a year. Includes every single winter day. It's my it was my first outside winter life challenge and, and uh, I did underestimate it. I did not expect the death so close to me because I was not that old yet. <laughs> Extreme cold alert one by one. Average temperature most time below to minus 20. Stay few minutes outside is a story. Live outside 24 hours per day is another. My original uh, thought in last summer was CD Toronto will not be that low. Watch us to live outside during the winter time. Street, street to home workers will not. They will give me a permanent subsidized unit. Uh, turns out I was treated worse than Kingman who lived 27 years ago. Kingman had a heat source which was bonfire. We, my only heat source was my warm air all on my mouth. I had to bury my head under three layer sleeping bags all the time inside noon to keep myself alive. We could not have a candle even inside the tent because firefighters have been checking us out every day to make sure we could be killed by cold by fire. Around four weeks, minus 30 degrees last winter, two most part cold in my tent left. Everybody was gone. I was so cold that I had to hop in streetcar for at least three hours per day, sometimes even at night to warm myself up. It was around seven more days and nights snow all night long. And I have to set up my alarm to wake me up every two hours to tap, all, uh, to tap the heavy low snow on my tent in case my tent got collapsed. It was scary memory and a trauma in my heart. I was so lucky to be alive. Toronto Public Health started collecting homeless death since 2017, and the number is not shared to public because Toronto Crown says it makes it difficult to act. So according to 2017 number, more than 34 people got killed due to the cold, uh, cold winter. I know I almost died too. I'm just a bit lucky, and this year whether I'm still lucky is unknown. Street to Home told me we have a lot of permanent substance units available since May and I didn't see anyone who can be in the park has moved into those units so far. I've been texting them once a week. Back to Moss and Hot Group, they told me we only focus on those who in Captain Red and first and open new 
project for the rest. Uh, luckily, I just checked from my new friend Park Strand three days ago. No single new friend group, uh, new friend group Brandon has moved into unit yet since uh, since 1.5 months ago. Look like highly likely I will spend another winter outside. I won't go nowhere until the last second of my life to push city to help everybody, especially extreme, uh, extremely poor, who uh, with no housing and a purse who has trouble to pay the rent. Green Party agrees we are having a severe housing crisis emergency in Canada and are ready to declare housing regulation human rights. NDP agreed to build numerous subsets of housing. It's so true. For example, pre-pandemic year in 2019 in April, according to rental.ca, average one-bedroom rent in Toronto is $2,186. Yes. Minimum wage full-time worker must be growing in class only $2,240. The rent is 98 percent of gross income. Even you work so hard like a dog, you get nothing left after covering the rent. It's more than day slavery. That's the that's the reason people get poor. According to OHRC.ca, which is Ontario Human Rights Commission page, quote: A tenant. Applicant should be spending no more than 25 to 30 percent of his or her income on rent. Thousands supposed to be non profitable products at the first place. Now, rich turn this living, living product to profitable products. They are, making, they are making money from you, your income. The more they make, the poorer you are. That's the main reason why people live in paycheck to paycheck and save it becomes abnormal. Pandemic makes absolutely work. Thousands and thousands of tenants face eviction and will end to be homeless. According to MDP.ca, Toronto rental price went 30% up since 2015. Minimum wage only went up 20 percent uh, in Toronto. Means we are 10 percent poorer compared with uh, 2015 on the John Tory and Justin Trudeau watch. According to RCI.net.ca 2020 data code, more expensive to find housing in Toronto than UK, London, San Francisco, Brisbane, and New York in 2020 under Justin Trudeau and John Tory's watch. According to HuffPost.com, uh, October data shows called over half a million, which is 500,000 people living property in Toronto in the year 2019. According to Federal Prime uh, Minister the Hart, uh, there are over 10,000 people in Toronto who are homeless on any given night. Yay! Using data from 2017, 34 people died of hypothermia. We can estimate totally 252 people killed by winter in Toronto since Mayor John Tory got into office in 2014. The record shows the year is not able to stop them, and the number will certainly go up to 2086 in March this year. And I may be the one if we don't do anything. Mayor Jatori would rather send 300 military troops to invade parks than visit us, which he never ever visit us once. And help us and scream his heart out for us. Mayor John Tory would rather watch massive tenants go evicted and become homeless since this May and do nothing about it. Mayor John Tory would rather clap and kick his responsibility back to Trudeau and Ford since he did, did not get enough funds to build houses and lower the rent that try as hard as he can to find a way that's his part. 
for example, give pressure to Kermes and Federer in the media every single week, like build a funding uh, platform, gathering the funds from the rich, like take a huge zero interest or low interest loan from federal banks to build new units. Mayor Jantori would rather widely few words about it's not his fault that doing absolutely nothing to help. Instead, he spent more than ten thousand dollars to evict each part. Include includes three hundred violent cops, one hundred security guards from Star Security Company, twenty construction technicians, and around two hundred construction fences from PGC Construction Company. At least five RCMP horses, two ambulances, twenty different type of cop vehicles, thirty park cleaners, food, water, and gasoline, etc. Mayor John Torres totally has spent at least four forty thousand dollars for four parks eviction. Shame. Yeah, I think I need much more than. Winter is coming again. I suggest we can hear every single week at City Hall of Queens Park to require city and permits to do their part to help those issues. I also suggest we need to protest at liberal and conservative campaign set before election day. I encourage you to vote. I know drink season will not fundamentally change everything, but at least can change something. We are still luckier than other dictatorship company, uh, country citizens. As per class citizen, we cannot afford to mess up any political opportunity, not only in federal, but next year, October, mayor election. Vote in competent person out. Vote what you believe and vote who you believe. Last, I require city lower tenants rent to the 30% gross income I stop evicting tenants. I require city stop evicting encampment residents. I require city drop out charges against peaceful protesters Woo! and residents. Woo! And a lot, I require city to build more than 20,000 permanent subsidized housing units now. So the people, people on the 10 years long waiting list and 10,000 people homeless is them now before another 34 deaths happen in winter again. No more death! Yes! Thank you, Jack Cross Park. Woo! Woo! Um, I regret to say that uh, I've just been informed about some suspicious activity happening. I just want to ask everyone to not leave here alone today. If you need, there will be escorts available by the orange cone. So please, if you have to leave, Make sure you are escorted off the premises by one of us. And if you're able to escort people, please also go visit the orange cone and they will help facilitate that. Thank you. Thank you. Because we keep ourselves safe. We keep ourselves safe. Okay, um, next up I have Aliyah Pavani. She's an outreach volunteer and organizer with the Encampment Support Network. Part the Parkville Neighborhood Committee. She was arrested and dragged and taken out of a trespass. Please welcome Aliyah. Hello. Uh, hi, I'm Aliyah. Um, and I got to know the residents of Lamport Stadium in Camden from my time volunteering with the Encampment Support Network Parkdale. Uh, for those of you who don't know, ESN is a network of volunteers who came together to deliver daily aid to the people who were forced into encampments during the pandemic. Because the already inadequate shelter system was teeming with COVID outbreaks, still is by the way, despite what the city's press releases will tell you, and because so many essential services that people relied on were suddenly closed and there was nowhere else for people to go. We'd go into the city's largest encampments every day with Gatorade, granola bars, tents, sleeping bags, harm reduction, fire safety equipment, and water. Basic humanitarian aid that the City of Toronto was refusing and still refuses to provide its own residents in a crisis. In that time, I met people who had been through its unspeakable trauma and hardship. Residential school survivors, people who came as refugees, 
people with PTSD from serving in Afghanistan, people who were injured from doing construction on condos, people whose ODSP payments didn't even come close to what was required for rent, people who couldn't find accessible housing, and people who couldn't secure an apartment even though they could pay rent because of anti-black racism. Yay! I also witnessed people taking care of each other. Encampment residents responding to overdoses, making sure women were safe, sharing food and supplies, checking in on the most vulnerable people there, and persuading them to seek medical assistance when they needed it. I showed up to support the roughly 24 people living in the Lamport Stadium encampment so that they could defend their homes against a militarized siege by the City of Toronto because they asked us to join them and to bring supporters with us. Because we understood something that the city refuses to understand, that when unhoused people say that the encampments are their best and safest option, it's not a fucking metaphor. Woo! People are literally fighting for their lives. Earlier this year, the Canadian press released data showing that incidences of violence in the city shelter system had tripled from 2016 to the beginning of 2021. John Tory wants you to believe we're just a bunch of quote-unquote outside agitators so that he can justify spending a billion dollars of public funds to beat us up. But a lot of the people who showed up that day are workers and volunteers who actually helped people get into the city shelter hotels. We're also the ones who had to step in when they came back to the encampment that same day after the city had thrown out most of their belongings and they found out that they weren't on the list when they actually got to the hotel. Or a week later because they couldn't sleep because staff would barge into their rooms unannounced five times a day, often in the middle of the night. A lot of people who had experienced sexual violence from living on the street. A lot of people were terrified to set foot in a shelter hotel because too many of their friends had died of overdoses in them. Something the city could have prevented if they'd listened to the frontline workers who told them what needed to happen for those places to be safe. Instead, they prioritized hiding people away as fast as possible instead of valuing their lives. If it feels hyperbolic to call Lamport Stadium a militarized siege, I don't know what else to call a 10-foot fence around the perimeter by 7 a.m., drones overhead for hours, surveillance vehicles, and hundreds of private security and police in tactical gear and on horseback. For unarmed people, to evict roughly 24 unhoused people I was proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with my community that day, both housed and unhoused. And for that, I was tackled by an officer, dragged along the ground and handcuffed. I was one of the first people arrested, and when I saw cops advancing on supporters and attacking them indiscriminately, I chose to go limp so that I could take a couple of officers out of the scene. Instead, one officer tried to carry me out by himself and dropped me on the ground twice while I was in handcuffs. You can see, yeah, a picture of my summer beach bod right here. Um, yep. um, then I was kept in a court services vehicle for almost three hours without access to a lawyer, without being told what my charges were. When I was finally released on a trespassing ticket, I went to 14 Division to demand the rest of the supporters be released. I was at the front of the crowd with our legal representative waiting to speak to Staff Sergeant Israel Bernardo when he pepper sprayed me and many others directly in the face, blinding me in a crowd where bodies were being thrown into me as I tried to escape. And if I had the choice, I'd do it again. Because... Because not only is it the rational response to a housing crisis that's killing people, it's the moral response. The night of the siege on Lamport Stadium encampment, there were about 10 to 15 people sleeping in a row on the ground outside the adjacent St. Felix respite. Many of whom had been in the encampment earlier. A couple of weeks later, we responded to a situation where former Lamport encampment residents were being forcibly evicted again by police off a small plot of land near the train tracks just down the street from the former encampment. And then about a week ago, I found out that a man I knew from Lamport had died of an overdose alone in a hidden spot near Lamport Stadium 
where he was discovered by a friend many hours later. The day after the siege on Lamport Stadium, an unhoused friend came up to us and jokingly asked how it felt to be treated like homeless people for a day. It's not lost on us that people are taking notice because of who is affected. But as long as our governments continue to support the financialized housing market instead of building social housing, we're going to keep showing up and standing with our unhoused neighbors as they defend the best and safest option that they have. Yeah. support for the residents of the encampment at Lamport Stadium and I was among them. I was there that day, as were many of us, to demand with urgency safe, affordable, and permanent housing for people living in the encampment. And that until the city has a plan in place to make that happen, that it allow residents to live in the communities they have created where they feel safe and have some stability. I arrived at the peaceful protest at 11.30 to see hundreds of police officers and private security surrounding the encampment area. Close to 1 p.m., police began dragging people from tents and beating them. Protesters rallied, and the police began then pepper spraying the crowd. I was assisting some protesters who had been sprayed by cleaning out their eyes with a mix of water and milk. I was standing among protesters when the line of riot police formed. Out of nowhere, I was violently grabbed by a group of riot police, forced to the ground, flipped on my stomach, and handcuffed. I was subsequently arrested and charged with possession of a weapon, Police claiming a water bottle filled with milk and water was the weapon. The police took my glucose monitor and maintained control over it, over my access to it, which made it very difficult to manage my condition. I was detained for seven hours without access to food that I needed to properly manage my blood sugar levels. It took me several days to be able to reestablish proper levels. I can only speculate that these arrests, or arrests of these kind, uh, are made to incite fear and make an accused life more difficult. An attempt to dissuade them from ever protesting again, to silence the public outcry. Despite this, and despite the actions made that day, I feel more compelled to speak out against injustices the city continues to enact against the poor working pe and working people of Toronto. We do not need a militarized, overblown police force attacking peaceful protesters and encampment residents. What we do need are safe spaces and support for encampment residents. We need housing designed for people and not for profit. Thank you. Give it up again for Kelsey. People's Movement. He was arrested and charged criminally at 14 Division. And we can see there's some photos of him here. Thank you. Hi guys. I just want to talk about uh, the housing issue that is being neglected and the brutality of the police these pigs that continue to criminalize us as community members, charge us for standing up for community, for standing up for each other. And the encampment was more of a community than people in this building. 
They looked out for each other more than people in this building look out for each other. They cared about each other and this is how the state, this is how the police come at innocent people who are just trying to survive, just trying to live. What COVID did was open a door for people. More homelessness came, not only in Toronto, but all around the city. I've seen. And the, 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 the pigs have came at people the same way they always came at people. Like this. Standing up like this with, with, with barricades, with horses. Why? Are we any threat to them? To us. I'll tell you, we are a threat to them. Why? Because we're organized, we're together. Yes. And when people are together, we are the biggest threat. And we are we are the ones that are gonna make the change. Not them. They won't. You know why? Because this is what they protect. They protect private properties. They protect the elites who don't care about us, who extorts us, who keeps us in poverty, who killed our native brothers and sisters. But we're going to fight back. We're going to come back. The way I see the encampment was a community. A community that was taking care of each other. What the city have done, they have pocketed them in different areas. They have pocketed them in different areas so the public can see what's actually going on. So that they can hide them away. But we're not going to stand for that. We're going to keep organizing around the city and we're gonna keep standing up and fighting for what is right and what is wrong. We're gonna demand that they fix this housing issue. We demand that they fix this housing issue ASAP. It's a poverty issue. It's not a housing issue. It's a poverty issue. It's a poverty issue. And even the how the police comes at people, not just in the city, not just in Toronto, but around the city. How they've killed innocent community members. How they injured, how they injured community members and continue to silence them by intimidating. Fuck all police. We're not going to stand for this. We're going to mobilize around the city. And this is, not the, this is just the beginning of what's going to happen. If our, if our demands are not answered by these politicians, who the fuck is John Tory? I don't give a shit about his name. Because he don't give a shit about us. We're going to continue to fight and we're going to continue to organize. And the message I have for the city and around the country is to continue to organize around your, around your community. Around the community that is neglected from the government. Because only us can take care of, uh, only us can take care of each other, not them. We see how they move. They come with horses. They come with with barricades. But it's gonna be it's gonna end soon. Cause we're gonna mobilize and we're gonna organize. And I and I plead to the communities to keep organizing, keep the momentum going. And I advise these politicians. If this is not answered soon, 
The city is going to see an uprising that has never been seen before. I encourage everyone to come out, speak out. Don't be scared, don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by these fucking pigs. Because they're nothing but pigs. The demands today is to drop the charges, drop the charges, drop the ticket charges even, and answer the housing problem that is being neglected, that is being pushed to the side. But it won't be pushed to the side. We, the communities, the people, are going to show the power that we actually have. Because the power is within it. the power is within us. It's not with the politicians. It's not with the fucking federal election that's coming up. It's with us. And it's not with these media either. The power is with the people. Poverty 
and criminalizing those supporting it and to roll out long-term permanent housing options. Thank you, Isabella. Here we have a photo here of Jade, surrounded by police and riot gear. And I just want to quote John Tory when he said it mostly went quite peacefully. That's what I got out of this image. Yeah. 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 He's a liar. He's a liar. All right, next I'm gonna bring up Jennifer Jewell, who's a former resident of Dufferin Grove Park and a current resident of the Bond Hotel. She was detained at Lamport on the 21st. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Jewell. I am a 51-year-old disabled homeless woman, and I am here to talk about the militarized police force that was used against the residents of Lamport Stadium. I lived in a park for four months in a small community of people I loved, whom I loved in return, who cared for and looked out for each other, and I was surrounded by nature and beauty every day. It is the only time in the last 18 months that I have felt safe or I was able to heal. That has not been my experience living in a shelter hotel. These places are isolating and are full of death and despair. Last week, three people died. I witnessed one of them from the window of my room. Two days later, I found out that the first friend I made at the bond died weeks ago and they did not tell us. The week before, another three residents overdosed and were sent to the hospital in a single day, although all survived. In comparison, eight people have died in the Cameron Car since 2010. John Tory cared about fire safety. I would not have been left behind in a fire in the hotel and they would be distributing fire extinguishers in the parks, which he still refuses to do. So I absolutely understand why people find living in a park safer than coming into these so-called safer indoor spaces. The police are not a solution to ending homelessness. When I went to Lamport, what I saw was a community of people who had made the park their home. One resident had surrounded their tent with plants and artwork. It was beautiful. And it was willfully destroyed by the police. Many of those who attended Lamport had pre-existing relationships with the tenants. We were there at their request. I was there because I know firsthand what it is to have the only space available to you in the world threatened. They had to have nowhere to go. Nothing could have prepared me for the level of violence at the hands of police. I questioned John Tory's belief that using riot police and private security against unhoused people is appropriate. I am ashamed of our city. None of Tory's actions help to house us. The money being spent to weaponize the police against us can house us for years. I witnessed them targeting specific individuals for harm, breaking bones, pushing people onto tents with a complete disregard for the health and safety of those who are still within. My friend Jamie was brutally choked by a cop when they tried coming to my rescue when three police physically assaulted me in my chair as I was trying to protect another friend, Sam. The police had separated Sam from the others and had both her arms so high up behind her back that I thought they would break. They isolated Alia in front of me, then dragged her away. When we erected barriers to protect people in their homes, a riot cop threatened me, approached me of all the others, and told me that I would be hurt if I did not leave. When I was able to watch the videos afterwards, I saw groups of police hurting people with other cops running up behind them to join in the violence. Watch those videos. I cannot imagine the level of hatred someone must have to try and obliterate a community so thoroughly as John Tory and the City of Toronto have. Please help us. For myself and others, I ask these things. To stop criminalizing homeless people, stop terrorizing us and weaponizing the police against those still living in parks and those trying to shelter the, survive the shelter system, many of which do not. 
and drop all charges stemming from evictions. When and John Tory will pay $6,000 a month to keep people in a shelter or a hotel, $200 a day, $6,000 a month, instead of fucking uh, advocating for ODSB and OW benefits to be doubled, that's your, that's your taxpayer dollars at work. $6,600 a month for each one of us. I've been in a shelter hotel eight months. That is three years of rent at market value. Three years I could be housed. I have been on the waiting list for wheelchair accessible housing for 15 years. They took, they took me off when I moved into the park because I refused three places that were not wheelchair accessible that were three times the cost of what disability gives me a month for rent. And now I'm starting all over. So we need them to build safe, accessible, and affordable housing now and stop killing us. Thank you. of people out of their homes. Many people facing charges have been involved throughout COVID in mutual aid networks because the city has abandoned people who are unhoused. They have been bringing water, food, shelter, and community to encampment residents. But we also know that many of the people that are facing charges are unhoused themselves. They are the brunt of who faces the criminalization both in the defense to housing and in the organizing around that and are facing the most serious charges. They are people who have faced criminalization while they have lived unhoused just for their poverty and for the fact of living unhoused. They have faced threats from the city throughout COVID to try to push people into unsafe shelter conditions and finally were violently evicted and arrested for trying to defend their housing. The city, the police, and now the criminal legal system is punishing people for this defense. We urge the Crown to withdraw these charges because there is clearly no public interest in their continued prosecution. People who are charged are committed to fighting these charges together so that every single charge is dropped and are committed to challenging these, um, all of these prosecutions by bringing up all of the rampant charter violations that happened during these arrests. People were denied access to counsel. People were detained unlawfully for over 12 hours and then violently arrested for expressing a political opinion and organizing together 
in the defense of housing. That clearly violates people's Section 2, Section 9, Section 10 Charter of Rights and Freedom Rights. All of these charges and tickets must be withdrawn and people are prepared to forcefully defend themselves all the way to trial if necessary. In the meantime, I think this election makes it very clear the need for people's leadership and organizing to address the underlying crisis at hand. All of our major federal parties are failing to address the real problem. They frame the housing crisis as a home ownership crisis. We know that in Toronto especially, it is a crisis of basic access to shelter, with nearly 10,000 people unhoused, 85,000 people on the affordable housing list, and over 35,000 people imminently at risk of eviction today. Exactly. And we know the issue is poverty, but we also know that this crisis results from political choices made by the City of Toronto and all three levels of government. It's the political choice to prioritize profit and the privatization of a basic need. That is what has resulted in the crisis in our parks this summer. We must The criminal charges are an example of the criminalization of people's organizing. We know that we must stand together to defend this organizing because that is the only thing that has brought real solutions for our community. And so we ask all of you to remain involved, to join us in this fight, and call for all charges and tickets to be dropped, and demand that all levels of government take real action and commit to providing housing for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seema. All right, we're coming to the end of our stop, drop, and roll out the housing uh, list of speakers here. And so lastly, I'd like to bring up Gru, who's a former resident of Trinity Bellwoods. Welcome, Gru. Hey, you know what's funny? Um, I saw that note about colorfully involved in all four of the clearings. I don't know if I was colorfully involved, but I was there. That's enough, right? Uh, except that it's not really enough. Just showing up isn't. Because the people who just show up, the people like me who come out to all of these things, get routinely targeted by these fine gentlemen behind me. Targeted for arrest. Targeted for, uh, for attacks of uh, pepper spray. Uh, even just pointed out out of a crowd as they talk amongst themselves of that guy needs that guy we need to keep an eye on and it's, it's terrifying when you're coming out to support your community and someone goes that guy that guy right there we're going to do violence towards him my apologies for pointing you out specifically but it gives, it gives an idea right it's it's, it's terrifying that these men with guns, with weaponry, can just come into our communities and say, fuck this, my apologies for that, uh, hey, we're going, to, we're going to target this person uh, because they show up, because they come out to, to provide support. Uh, earlier, th earlier this afternoon, Sam mentioned that there had been some suspicious activity and asked people to leave in pairs. Uh, or at least to not leave alone. That was moments after we had heard that Skylar Williams, our first speaker today, was arrested a few blocks away as he was leaving because he had left alone. If we are going to talk about community defense, to talk about standing up for our communities, 
We need to do that. Skyler was apparently taken to uh, 14 Division, uh, although we haven't actually heard for sure if that is where he is. But if you have a few moments after this press conference today and you can show up in support, please do so. When we say that we are here to, to keep ourselves safe, we mean that we are here to keep us safe. Yeah. I can't say the word because I'm on camera. <laughs> CBC, I love you guys, but lighten up on the censorship. No, I can't. John, uh, John, John Tory doesn't care about us. Our city councilors don't care about us. The police actively target us to try to intimidate us. The only people who we can stand up and, and expect to stand up for us are ourselves. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Okay, folks, uh, just, just a recap. Uh, Skyler, Skyler Williams of 1492, land defender at 1492 Landback Lane, was just arrested right immediately after he spoke. Uh, two plainclothes police officers shoved him into an unmarked vehicle, which then sped away uh, to an uh, undisclosed location. We believe he's being held at 14 Division. This is a continuation of the criminalization we've seen amongst unhoused people. Uh, indigenous people are over overrepresented in that community. We need to be, we need to show up for Skyler right now. We need to all go to 14 Division. This is an emergency. This is an emergency. We need to be there for him. Please share it on social media. 14 Division. The the address is. Uh, uh, somebody help me out here. Dover Court and Dundas. Okay, we're gonna go over there. We're gonna show support, and we're not gonna fucking leave until he's released. Okay, let's get that right now. Let's get that right now. This is an emergency. Okay? I just want to say thanks again to everyone who spoke today, and we'll see you at 14 Division. Thank you. No one go alone. No one go alone. Buddy up. Buddy up. Nobody should leave here alone. Please leave in groups. If you're unsure about who to leave with, please go see the people at the Orange Cone. Thank you. Thank you. 